Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Brian LeMay, President and Executive Director of the Bostonian Society. The Bostonian Society is dedicated to studying and preserving Boston's unique history embodied in materials, records, and structures such as the Old State House, and in sharing an understanding of the revolutionary ideas born here. Brian has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Brian, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Boston is so much the cradle of the revolution. Boston, Philadelphia, New York, these places are the central place where these ideas took root. Talk about the Bostonian Society and the importance of our revolutionary heritage to America today. You know, I think you're right. Uh, the history is, is part of the, the brand of, of Boston. It's always been identified as being a historic place. It's one of the reasons why uh, businesses do business in, in Boston. It's one of the reasons that uh, employees like to be located in, in Boston. It's the way that the city presents itself to the outside world as, as, as a world city because of the, the important historic things that, that happened here. And I think in addition to that, it's also brands itself as uh, the center of revolutionary ideas that began in the 18th century uh, at the time when Boston was the world financial capital for the, the Western Hemisphere, for the, the British Empire. And uh, it was the, the first place that the, the Bank of England uh, issued paper money, for instance. And it continued to be a place where uh, new ideas were spawned. And Boston has a self-image of itself as being a really important center of the universe in many respects. It's the center of learning. And it's a place that I think continues to be the origin of many new ideas uh, with the, the high-tech industry that's, that's been spawned along the, the Beltway and the, the, the bio, biomedical uh, industry that uh, identifies Boston as being a, an important place for innovation as well. And one of the things that I find so interesting is Boston as an inflection point and a continual inflection point in American history. The idea of, of Boston in, at that time uh, being right at the center of a time when we were moving from an agrarian uh, economy, an agrarian system, even a government system that was based in agrarian sensibilities to a more urbanized and indeed international trade focus, which still is so important to the U.S. today. I think that's true. And uh, the ideas that arose here have also, I think, in fact, that, that may be one of the reasons why what happened here is so significant. Not necessarily because it's, it's a crossroads for trade uh, or for the migrations of peoples, but because of the ideas that arose here. Uh, Boston was at an interesting spot in the 18th century when the basic notions of what it meant to be a free person in the British Empire uh, were, uh, came into conflict really with uh, another tradition in New England which had to do with uh, self-government because of the settlement patterns in, in this part of the country. And it's when those two ideas came together and came into conflict and sparked, well, new ideas that uh, I think is the essence of the revolutionary movement that began here in Boston rather than in other parts of the country. And it's those ideas that I think have had a worldwide influence, not just in the United States, but really we find being played out in uh, the streets of Cairo and throughout the world, even today, a lot of these issues that were worked out on the streets of Boston uh, being of continuing relevance today. What, one of the things that I find so interesting is the, um, the description of your mission as preserving uh, Boston's unique history embodied in materials, records. Yeah. Talk about the materials, the records, talk about the structures, talk about how the uh, Bostonian Society pursues its mission in, by preserving, examining, uh, and revealing the meaning of, of objects? 
Uh, objects are kind of at the heart of, of any museum operation, of course. And uh, objects, artifacts, uh, objects that have some significance and meaning, uh, have a power to uh, engage people in, in the way that images or, or, or words on a page don't necessarily. And these are the things that people come to make pilgrimages to see, to uh, be in the presence of. And that's something that uh, we have to uh, try to present in a way that is meaningful. What type of curatorial approach do you take as you, um, as you utilize objects and create the connection between the object and the, um, the viewer? I, th I think there's a, there is a misconception that, that objects have the power to speak for themselves. It's the responsibility of museum people, of curators, to explain what the significance of the object is. And there are many ways of, of, of presenting that. The uh, museum field is in the middle, I think, now of a transition, of a, a change in the way that it, it perceives the, uh, that these uh, explanations can be conveyed. Uh, there was a time at, at which uh, it was conceived of being a very passive exercise. A uh, museum visitor might view an object behind a, a piece of glass in a, in a vitrine. You might, you might put the object there and that's it. Right. And it's the responsibility of the museum curator to explain what, why that object is important. And in particular, buildings, structures, have such a power because you're walking into history, you're walking through history. It is, a, it is such an evocative view. This is exactly what is happening all those years ago, 250 years ago, 230 years ago, when the architect that is conceiving That's right. that place is thinking about the colonials who will come in and talk with the governor. That's right. The, the architecture is designed to send a message. And each of the, uh, the architectural elements send a certain kind of signal. To the furniture, the, the chairs. The uh, columns on the front. Which, and in fact, when, when uh, people come to, to visit the old building that we manage, the, the old state house, there's uh, sometimes a question in their minds of whether they're supposed to be inside this, this building. This building which is designed to look so official and to send certain signals that certain people, the right kind of people, are to be admitted inside, but not necessarily everybody. And it's our task to try to pull people in. And in fact, in, in our, our newest exhibitions, we're, we're trying to accommodate that, that sense that people have by inviting people to come and occupy the, the spaces that are, uh, have some historic importance. Uh, in the, the council chamber, for instance, we're, we're creating very exact reproductions of some of our collections and inviting people to come in and pull up a chair, sit at the table in the room where Samuel Adams came into conflict with the British authorities and where John Hancock was uh, inaugurated as the first governor of Massachusetts and where the, the Declaration of Independence was read in 1776. And to explore the the artifacts, or maybe the reproductions of the artifacts, the artifacts. that, that uh, would have been there in the 18th century in order to come to uh, some kind of conclusions in their own minds uh, about what happened here and why it's important and what its larger significance is, rather than simply being told that's what a, a, the curator thinks is important. And this is a multidimensional experience. It's an interpretive experience that also can live. These objects, these structures, the furniture, whether it's reproduction or not, um, these objects live through time. In different times, they have different relevance, and, they, and they, that relevance needs to be rediscovered for that time. The only way that's possible is by making them accessible in, in, in such ways. That's right, that's right. And uh, museums are odd places. They, they've taken a, objects out of their original context to a certain extent. Uh, I think historic sites have a certain advantage in that respect yes. because they provide the original context. Not that we can allow visitors to sit in the original chair that John Hancock or, or the colonial governor may have sat in, 
but we can allow people to occupy the original spaces, the places where the actual history happened. And there's, there's a certain power that the, that the place has, just as the original objects do, that uh, people pay attention to. And isn't it so important to self-identification and, and, and one's play, uh, identifying one's place in a society? If we look at our history, there are times in our history where a person who is of African descent, a person who is Native American, themselves would not have been able to walk into those, uh, those buildings. And now we have people who come in and they think in their terms about their history and about that experience. It will be a completely different experience than somebody who is an immigrant uh, coming in, in um, at the turn of the century. Um, it will be a completely different experience for somebody who, um, whose uh, forefathers, uh, who, whose uh, ancestors um, came from this land and were uh, disenfranchised and brutalized, or somebody who was brought over from um, Africa or other continents uh, in, in abject slavery and poverty. We have this notion that the history began in the United States with the pilgrims, and then there were maybe the Salem witch trials, and then we had a disagreement with uh, the British authorities. And then fast and then forward there, to the there, Civil there, there War. And, and <laughs> but in fact, there, there were certain kind of constants that we had to deal with, including the issue of the, the relations between, between races and between sexes and between those who had and those who didn't. Uh, in fact, in, in revolutionary Boston, the, the very vocabulary of, of slavery informed our ideas about what liberty was. Talk, talk about that. This was an, an issue that was, was uh, by mutual consent uh, compromised and maybe there, there's some resonance in the, in the present day. The, uh, the, the matter of, of slavery was actually one that was debated here in, in Massachusetts, although Massachusetts is, is, is proud of its, its status as being one of the first places where slavery w was, was outlawed. It was something that was very much in the air, even in the 18th century at the time when we were, we're talking about the freedom of, of all mankind. I think it's mythologies like this that make public history, uh, and public history that deals with new ideas, the intersection of the old mythologies and uh, maybe what's commonplace in the, the more academic research world makes it more interesting. Boston is, presents a good uh, situation to talk about the, the changes in public history. A case study in, pub in how public history has, has changed. Yes, and I think with the, the developments in uh, museum uh, philosophy, uh, there is the possibility to talk about how public history differs from uh, academic or, or the more scholarly aspects of, of, of history. Public history is, is the place where the research really, where the rubber of, his, of, of, of historic research hits the road. It's the place where we begin to think about what the significance is of the, the research is to the larger society. Sometimes it's a bit rocky when the, uh, what's considered commonplace in, in the, the research world hits the, the mythologies that we may have retained from uh, our school days. Uh, this idea that there were good guys and bad guys and uh, the, the good guys prevailed and the bad guys wore the red coats, uh, when in fact we were all British at one time. But I think this also is, is the moment in which public history can make things more interesting to the general public by making it a more creative process. You know, there was uh, a time in a, a previous part of my career when I, I was involved in an organization called the Material Culture Forum in, in Washington which was based on the idea that different disciplines could provide uh, a leavening influence on one another by talking about the things that they may have in common. Two ideas coming together, creating new ideas out of them. I think the same thing is true in, in public history. When we have a certain respect for, for our visitors and allow them to uh, come to certain conclusions about the, the material that we present to them, I think there's the opportunity to make things more interesting to them. 
Well, my own life, uh, as I think about um, an example that I've experienced, it, it revolves around the most the most poignant to me. It revolves around Columbus. Mm -hmm. I was educated uh, with the idea of Columbus as heroic explorer. Um, at a certain point, there was an inflection in which people were presenting Columbus as um, a a, um, a brutal villain. Now, heroic explorer or brutal villain? There's a similar situation here in Boston. The, uh, during the, the years just preceding the bicentennial, there was a, uh, an agreed upon storyline that uh, all historic tourism was based on. Originally, uh, we, we took all of our visitors from one point to another, and there was this inspiration that occurred in the 1950s to connect physically the historic places by a red line in the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. That created a kind of an odd uh, storyline, though, for, for Boston's history because it wasn't chrono chronological and it didn't have a particular historic point to be made to it. The re reliance, there, therefore, was on these uh, traditional mythologies of who was the hero and who, was, who were the villains. And to the present day, I think there is still a, a, a large measure of that a 1950s mythology that is played out and people walk the Freedom Trail each year. The Boston and Massacre having a particular uh, storyline attached to it, the various right. other elements of our mythology. That's right, um, that's right. And, and many of them drawn from uh, simple propagandistic illustrations, That's right. uh, stories, newspaper articles that now have gained prominence, but at that time were not viewed as truth. They were just viewed as part of the dialogue and the, the yelling back and forth between the various factions. That's right. There were the haves and the have-nots. Now, I think that we have the, the chance, too, to, to redo this, to come up with a different paradigm for the 250th anniversary of many of these events, which are rapidly approaching. Uh, and I think in order to do that, we have to uh, join the pieces of the story together in more, some more coherent whole. That does mean that, that organizations like mine have to work more closely with other organizations because we, we can tell a part of the story. Although the organization that I represent is maybe in a better position than, than some others because uh, the historic site that, that we, we manage among, and the position that the organization has had in the city over the, the course of Boston's history has been broader and more, more in, uh, encompassing. The, the old state house was the center of, of everything that happened in the, in the 18th century. All the stories that are told in other parts of Boston have some relationship to what happened at the old state house. All the characters in 18th century Boston had some relationship to the center of the city. The, 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 the town hall of the city was the old state house as well as the, uh, the center of the colony. So I think that if we're going to create a new model for giving our visitors a better experience, a more uh, interactive experience with their history, we're going to have to uh, create a critical mass that includes a number of historic organizations working together. And not just historic organizations, but because historic uh, Boston's history is such an important part of its business climate, its, its, its national image, and its tourism industry, we have to include uh, various levels of government and also the corporate world. And I'm hopeful that the Bostonian society can play an important role in this new paradigm. As a connector amongst right. these various constituents, as a revealer of history, and perhaps as a re-revealer of previously hidden history. That's right. That's right. Brian LeMay, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and for the work of the Bostonian Society, and thank you for your insight. Thank you.